There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground, far from all worries and trouble. Welcome to the Vine Permaculture Podcast, episode two. This week we had a lunchtime learning. We've just finished recording that. Uh, that'll be lunchtime learning episode two, funny enough. Uh, and this week we covered uh, seeds. We covered basic tools and basic equipment. I'm Cormac Hargan. I'm Crystal. Thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, mind Thanks very every. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, so we just recorded our episode there. Um, sorry, my voice is about the horse. I'm not, <clears throat> not the Georgie best at the minute. So uh, I think the first in the agenda was the uh, seeds. Crystal, do you mind summarize up just what you talked about briefly? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so seeds really sort of touched on um, kind of what do you choose when, you, when you're looking at planting your garden? How do you know what? What you want to grow um and then kind of then going into sort of the varieties um and then heirloom versus gmo so i guess first of all how do you know what to grow and i think it's actually something that uh you've done a lot of work with cormac too like when you're working with a client one of the first questions you generally ask them is what do you like to eat um yeah. and i think that when you've brought that into our workspace that's carried over with other people we're working with as well because that's certainly a very important question to ask when you're designing a garden um so so, sort of what I talked a little bit about was how do you choose that what am I going to eat I personally love onions and tomatoes and um um, just I like pretty much any veggies but certainly I love growing my own salads and then of course seed saving where every year when you're growing those those foods that you love at the end of the season, having a couple of extra plants or taking a tomato or two, if that's what you want to save seeds from and um, keeping those and, and sort of um, the genetic, the memory of the seed, it becomes a more resilient plant to your climate. So year after year, as you're growing and saving and growing and saving, those plants that you love to eat become more resilient plants. And then something I kind of wanted to touch on a little bit in the lunchtime learning, but the window being as short as it was, I didn't get to really talk about very much was um, the support species. Like we're saving seeds for the foods that we grow, but we're also adding marigolds and nasturtiums and these other support species, which of course we can eat. um, But where especially for these annual plants that some of them are going to self-seed which basically means they're going to like a a nasturtium it's going to go to seed and drop it into the soil and then the next season will germinate on its own Um, and so that's one way that it's going to do it or you can save those seeds yourself keep them in a dry dark place and then try again planting them yourself the next year um But yeah, the support species are really important, like your sunflowers and dill, for example, these are annual plants that are going to self-seed or be dispersed by birds and things. But these are plants that are bringing in natural insects, native insects. If if Sunflowers where I am in this area, we use a lot of the native flower and we save the seeds from that. It's also food for the birds in the winter. So we grow some for them and some for us and some for seed saving. So uh, I don't know about you where where you are and what seeds you're saving, um, but for me, I'm doing a lot of the native seeds and my favorite vegetables that I want to grow year after year. Yeah, um, sunflower seeds for definite. Um, every year I get new seeds. And I, I guess started off with uh, one packet of some, mixed sunflower seeds from Irish Seed Savers, uh, and there was a mixed variety, and yeah, just picking what I like then and there's the the, the like massive heads like thousands and thousands of seeds on them so again I fed them the chickens kept some grew more sunflowers the next year and I think too there's loads of uses like sunflower oil so sunflowers definitely oh, yeah. uh one I would definitely have in, the, in, in any garden if you if your climate allows it have them in there um, they're great for small spaces too they bring so much color and and, and happiness to a small space because they go just they just grow up yeah and it's that it's that uh depth so it gives you uh 
almost another layer layer, <clears throat> layer on your garden. Yeah. It's, it almost becomes a canopy layer in a small garden. And it does. Uh, it does, yeah. And to me, it just gives you that extra because mine's always go up over the fence. So all you see then is the the wee heads popping up over the fence. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's kind the of nastur- cool. <laughs> uh, the nasturtiums I let go to seed every year on my potato bed. And then when I uh, plant potatoes, harvest the potatoes, then the nasturtiums come up themselves. And then I cut that back at the end of the season and then add more biomass compost. And then the following year, then plant potatoes in that bed again. And then sure enough, when the potatoes are finished, every the nasturtiums come yeah. back up and, co- and cover them. It must be like cover. every time you're moving those potatoes, those seeds are just getting like sort of buried into the soil. It's like uh, naturally just um, turning them in. And then when you said you chop them back, do you like chop it back and then leave that on the soil, the nasturtiums at the end of yeah, the season? Yeah, just get a, like a pair of shears and just cut everything to the base. So just cut everything to the base. Uh, and that just, and the seeds lie there and they come back. So it's like a, <clears throat> they're obviously happy there. And then the seeds that, the strongest seeds that are best suited to that environment, uh, they just come back. I never really bothered with lettuce seeds because it was just, there's no point. The lettuce seeds are like, and it's too, I don't think it's as, for a small space garden, I don't think you need to collect that many. I think you just need to learn the practice of doing it so that if you move up to bigger yes. space, then that you have that ability there. And then if you move up, say, a quarter or half acre garden, then you can start thinking about more serious seed saving. But my favorite part yeah, is the, the abundance. Like you start off with one wee seed, get you a plant, and then you have a thousand seeds the next year. Oh, that's it. Plant. That's what oh, that's what seed. I love about it. it's like you can you can buy one packet of seeds and that's the only packet of seeds you might need for for years and years and years and years. Yeah. Uh, and and some of those seed packets are a dollar or something. But it's interesting you say that about lettuce because where I am right now, I didn't have this issue where we were in California, but here in Colorado, what I'm experiencing with the lettuce once it goes to, it's bolting really quickly because of the extremes that we have here in our environment. So I probably need to experiment a little bit with some other varieties that are more suitable or see if I can find a community garden or someone who's sharing seeds. They've been germinating here for quite a while. So that's more resilient um, to these extremes, but what I'm finding is they're not very strong. And so they're being attacked by aphids and by other creepy crawlies and things, which is not happening with the other plants, which I have been saving seeds from and germinating. So I don't know if there's something there with that, but definitely the lettuce is one that I am buying each year because saving the seed from it can be sort of tedious. My time was not really um, well spent in saving that seed when I was able to just get it for a dollar <laughs> anyways to buy new ones. But what I found was they're really being attacked by aphids. So I started growing more um, dill and um, sunflowers in and around where the aphids were attacking my lettuce. And I think it did bring in a lot of ladybugs. Those plants tend to attract a lot of ladybugs. So that was great, but it wasn't completely foolproof. And so what I found is lettuce is a pain in the butt to save seeds from. But I think if I was able to have been doing that more, maybe I'd have a resilient plant that wasn't as stressed and becoming um, sort of attacked by, it's like the bugs and things know the weak plant, right? So they go in and they just attack it. So that was a, that was a real frustration for me this past season, actually. Yeah. Uh, it is it's just the meat just doesn't make sense for lettuce because it's just you take up a small <laughs> space <clears throat> and then if you let if yeah. you let some go to seed you're waiting that long it's, it's, it's occupying a space in the garden like yes some absolutely fruit, some first neck goes to seed it still looks all right it, it doesn't look too bad you can just leave it it's it's not really taking up That's that much right. space that high up um yeah i love it too when the the birds come in and they start hanging off of those sunflowers and it gets a little bit of a sway to it <laughs> as they're picking out the seeds. And all, and all really I cool. do was, my, it's uh, it's like I, I have uh, oregano and uh, hair bushes. <clears throat> I'm gonna, they give you thousands and thousands of seeds. Uh, lovely purple flowers and uh, I guess oregano, thyme, sage. 
And what happens, I find, is when they when you just go around, you just uh, sort of bust them seed heads and just let them grow in the ground, and then you'll get seedlings come up, and then you can take them seedlings out and transplant them to their pot. And again, it just it just multiplies. And now, uh, what I also That's try awesome. and do is chive seeds as well. I love the purple flowers on them. Is I really like garlic chives, so but they're very hardy seed. And what I've been doing is taking the seed heads and going to a different part of the garden and just throwing the seeds and seeing if they take. Yeah. And just and are they taking? With... No. <laughs> but I read somewhere <laughs> if you give if you give it long enough. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But I think chives are notoriously the hard to get to go to seed. Uh, but I, yeah, especially I too, if you're having, if you like get rain or if you, you're having like a damp, um, if it's damp at that point, or if you've got something in the soil that's eating or birds that are eating any of those seeds as well. That's something that I experienced here. Cause one of the methods that I go with, with planting seeds and, um, people might think it's a bit weird, but I like to just go and get a mixed handful and just sort of throw it out there and see what grows i've tried it in a lot of different test plots and it's like i'm going to neglect this one and i'm going to water this one and the ones that were neglected here i was surprised by what was growing and then the ones that we did actually like tend to a lot more did grow but it was a really good experiment because i was able to see which seeds were and which plants and which varieties were hardy for where i was living and that's following season i was able to then duplicate that but this time i was able to add more of the ones that I knew were going to be um, like the poppy. I used a California poppy. So it's not necessarily native to here, but it grew so well. And we had such a shortage of pollinators that we were actually starting to see pollinators coming in because we had um, increased our, you know, the, the support species for our vegetable gardens. But yeah, but I have a question for you, Cormac. What is your stance on collecting seeds from your kitchen scraps? Uh, too much hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, because there's the whole GMO thing and the heirloom varieties, right? So like you could go out to your community gardens or your seed library, local library, or um, buy heirloom seeds from your state or area um, and plant those. Or for a very cost-effective method, something that I've done personally, um, has I've taken seeds from great big juicy tomatoes that I buy at the grocery store and I dry them out and then I plant them and then we end up with these tomato plants. Sometimes I think because of GMOs, because a lot of the grocery store produce come from those commercial operations, which, you know, then there's, it gets a little bit weird with how the seeds are, um, I don't here, know what the word is for it. I'm, I'm in the EU, so we have different rules than the US. The US, are, um, I think anything goes there. I'm not I'm not so sure to quote me on that, but I know the uh, very strict rules here on introducing the GMOs. Now I'm not an expert on it at all. I don't see the harm if you have a tomato and you buy it, go grow it at your back and see what happens. I have no no opinion on it. Uh if you yeah. have the if you have I, I have no I wouldn't be saying don't do it. Um because I know I know in America, when they import like blueberries, they, they spray them with radiation, don't they? They, they kill them, uh, kill the seeds. I'm not sure. I know that uh, yeah, Emily Gardner, know. I think, was on it one time. He, he said that, that and then, but it doesn't happen here where I am. So I can get blueberry seeds off the blueberries. So it's, wow. uh, and I know Killing, he, that's what he does every day. He collects food scraps from a restaurant and any seeds he collects and he tries to plant. So, I would say go for it, and it's an easy way. It's an easy way just to get going, and it's like experiment to see what happens. But then, uh, a lot of them need how would you call it cold shock, or they need to be cold for a certain period of time. Oh before yeah, they, um, stratification. Ah, uh, stratus. That's the word. So yeah, that, that, they need <laughs> or stratified, that. or uh, yeah, yeah. No, so that's they, a really they, good point too. You need to throw them in the fridge for a few months, then you don't know have they been stratified or, 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 or I just don't know. Yes. Uh, to me, it wouldn't bother I me. I know, I know I've heard of people just throwing tomatoes in the ground, seedlings come up, and then they just get the seedlings. Oh, absolutely. I mean, compost. When I throw my compost around, I'll often find I end up with some kind of volunteer plant that's 
the seed has has been in the compost heap like pumpkin is a huge one pumpkins and cherry tomatoes for whatever reason love it where I am and so wherever I'm spreading my compost that tends to just happen it comes up I allow it I think the only complication in the U.S. is whether there's a um like if it's it's protected and you want to sell as a commercial crop um the genetics of the particular seeds might be protected by the owner who has the patent on the seed or something so to go ahead and sell those you could get into trouble but for a backyard gardener for for getting started just growing it yourself at home and and eating this for your family there's i don't see any problem with letting seeds come up in your compost and harvesting right, the pumpkins I, off I, it. we did that this I, year I, I, right i think I would say definitely if there was any chance they were GMO, I wouldn't I wouldn't put them in, in the garden. I was just like, no. I think you don't really know though, right? Like if you if you're buying it from the grocery store, how do you know? Here you do, you think? Here you have to state it's it's GMO. Uh, I'm right? not sure there's much about it. I don't know enough about it. Uh, yeah. but I know I know it's the regulations here are much tougher than the US. And uh, they're much stricter. So it's something I suppose I should educate myself about, but I never, <laughs> I wouldn't. I, Me too. I'm assuming here that it's not GMO and that's stated, but. Maybe we'll get never. some comments here. People can chime in and uh, and help us learn a little bit more about it as well. Yeah, we did talk about it last week and I just basically says no to GMO. Yeah, uh, because as well, if it's GMO seed, you don't, um, if you say you don't own it, so you're not, you're, you don't have permission to replant it. Um, you only get it on license. There's, it's more for commercial growing on a large scale. You'd actually get GMO seed. And then would you actually want to plant GMO seed? Because I think the bit of GMO, uh, the traits that they grow do rely on the chemical inputs as well. So you wouldn't really want it. It's not... It's, it's... I think too, if you had um, a few different varieties of the same plant. So if you had three different kinds of tomato and you took a grocery store tomato seed and you planted it in there and then you ended up with well, maybe tomatoes is not a very good example, cucurbits or something, you know, and you get a cross-pollination going. So now the genetics of the the seed offspring, if you're collecting that, might have that GMO seed genetics in it as well. Possibly. Right? Uh, all right. Like, <laughs> we, have to, we have to remember that this is for beginners. <laughs> yeah, okay, yes, taking so, it back down. No Moving GMO. right along now. No <laughs> Yeah, so I think that covers seeds. What was next up was uh, basic tools. Um, yep. So we discussed the basic hand tools, just the, the, the three simple ones that you always get in a set together. Uh, and then if you have a lot, the bigger you go, the more tools you're going to need. But again, if you're, you can start with your bare hands, just, just get the dirt and move it if you don't mind getting your hands dirty. And then, but depending on your region and risk of spider bites, I have got stung maybe three times by just in the garden, just by lifting something and having a bee underneath the yep. wee lip. And then I feel bad then because the bee dies. So it's like, yeah. oh, poor bee. Uh, so I, wearing a pair of gloves, I wouldn't have felt anything. But at the same time, I try to avoid wearing gloves uh, just to get that uh, healing effect off the soil and that sort of exchange yeah. of bacteria and, the, and just that health health of it um isn't that what your parents say when you're a kid they're like go and eat some dirt it'll build your immune system <laughs> uh, i think that's it's important like uh yeah well I think absolutely it's proven. It's, it's proven it's not it's not a myth or nothing that, that exchange nope. has to yep happen. that's science science is backing that so <laughs> yeah nice. i yeah. think um very good um that <laughs> The bee sting thing, anyone who's allergic to bees and things like that, that might be something for them to be mindful of, certainly. And and what they need in their tool belt or their equipment, for sure. Maybe they need to have, to have some gloves on. But I agree with you. I like to just get my hands right into the soil. Yeah, it's like, a, I used to be wild, wild fussy. I drove my mother mental and then I started going fishing when I was 15, 16. And I'd be sitting on the riverbank, put a worm on, chuck it in and just eat my sandwich. <laughs> so I went, I went from no 
went for the money exchange, and I was like, ah, it doesn't matter. It's just worm. It's just worm guts or worm just and then you, know, you start sort of. This is probably just, TMI, you just, but you just do that. My there, son is like, yeah. he's grabbing the worms out of the out of the worm thing, and he was trying to eat them when he was about three years old. And I was like, no, that's going a little too far. Don't do that. Don't eat those worms. Plus, they weren't in my garden collected from anywhere that I know. So the source of those worms is unknown. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, so you find that one in the garden, then you'd be picky about it in the house and you're washing your hands with dirt in the garden. You are just dirt in your hands. You yeah. Yeah. Certainly, I agree. It, it's a, it's good for you. Well, and science agrees. It's a good for your body. It is good for your body. Tripping over my own words today. <laughs> And then, uh, 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 so the, the larger you get, the more tools you're going to have to get. But start off small and just build. Get a get a set. Get a maybe a fork or a shovel. But just start off. Don't go mad and buy all the tools because then when I caught all the gear and no idea, well, it's like start off slow. And I, I you know get tools as you as you need them, acquire them. Yes, that is a very good point. Get them as you need them. Um, I think for me. That was, that's how I've, got, I mean, it's so expensive if you're just going to go out and buy all the tools at once. Uh, if you don't need the tool, why do you have it? So I guess once you know you need the tool and there's a use for it on your space, then yeah, get the tool. My favorite hand tool, like small hand tool is a hori hori. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's, um, it's basically... Uh, yes kind of it's it's kind of like you can use it like a shovel you can use it to cut um and it's got a serrated bit on it as well it's not super sharp but it's very very practical um i uh, i like it because i can stick it into my belt if i'm wearing my overalls it actually fits into any one of the cargo pocket type things on my overalls and it's multi-purpose like i can be digging with it or i can cut with it or i can kind of saw with it a little bit um it's not perfect at any one of those things but it gets you through it's just a great multi-functional tool that i love to keep on my person when i'm in the garden yeah, mix a bit of compost with it uh, i'm not i spent half my day looking for my tools <laughs> <laughs> well see that's another thing too like your storage your tool storage have you seen what i saw this online and it was someone had taken a bucket and they filled it with sand and they added oil. And I can't remember what kind of oil. We should definitely do a little research on this to see how or try it and test it out ourselves. Um, and so when they were done with like their hand tools, like their shovels, their little diggers and stuff like that, they would stab it down into the sand with the oil and it would protect it from rusting um, just by storing it like that. So I don't think that that's going to work for some of those larger hand tools, like your shovels and and, and stuff like that. But for those smaller hand tools, I would like to see how that really works out. Have you seen that before? No, I've not seen that before. My tactic is two nails on the wall, just hang them up. Just they're, hang they're, it up. They're, yep. they're, they're, they don't take up any space. You hang them up there because uh, yep. I've had them in pies before and you, you go to look for one and you get hit in the head with the other <laughs> one. <laughs> you you hit one bit and the other one hits you in the head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's what yeah. I do, but I, I do, I, I, I'm desperate. I, I, I use a tool and leave it and then walk away. And I, where, where is this stuff? Uh, it is, that's why I don't <laughs> use my hands most of the time. It's like, uh, but my, my favorite tool is, yeah. to, uh, is a Chillington hoe. Uh, I use it for everything. If I've, I've had one tool to use in the garden, I could get away with that and not use anything else. It's good for lifting sod, digging holes, moving compost. It's just a good all round um multi purpose tool. Oh that's awesome. I'll put a link in the description they one. And uh they're fantastic. It was recommended by guys on YouTube. Um I can't remember now. I think it was Joe Mills digging for dinner or something. He used to use one and he recommended I got one and they're brilliant. That's awesome. Mm. Do you have any particular like favourites? Yeah, I um I it depends on where you are and what this tool is called but basically and here in the US it's just called a I think it's just a digger and it's basically 72 inches long like it's like it's it's a great big 
uh, looks like a like a crowbar kind of tool, but it's a big metal rod and it's really heavy. So where I am with rock and clay, that has been a lifesaver. I've also been able to use it just lightly lifting it like six to 12 inches off the ground and dropping it onto the ice that we've got building up outside. We've got about five inches of ice underneath our snow and everything. So as the snow is melting and then the evening, it'll refreeze. So we're getting these thicker layers of ice coming. And so this is a great garden tool that I'm using every time I'm out in the garden in the summer when I'm digging around or I'm planting trees and things like that. But in the winter, I'm actually still using it to just like sort of drop it and let the weight of it sort of break up that ice, especially up alongside my house. It's a 10% grade and we've had to cut it in and sort of terrace it. And so where we've done that, and there's a sort of the step walkway, that's becoming dangerous because of all the ice that's built up on it. So that tool, I can get that out there and I can use that as well. I think people use the back end of it like a tamp because it's got a round flat bit as well. And the weight of it is what um, is just really useful. So it does two sort of functions, I suppose. It digs and it tamps, but that's probably my favorite tool. I've had neighbors ask me, can I borrow that big bar that you've got? <laughs> <laughs> they're like trying to dig out a dead tree or um, break up the clay or move some rock. And that's what it's been wonderful for. Yeah. I suppose that's, that's pretty useful in Colorado where you are. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> yes. how much it would just be good to hear because I would just one day muck. Uh, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I that's just, it. I, I just looked at one of them things. It, it looks good for the zombie apocalypse as well. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it probably would be. I guess uh, you could stack the functions with that one for sure. Uh, but good in uh, extreme conditions then? Yeah, I can't imagine it would be very good for sandy soils or wet soils because you're, you're not really um, – it's definitely good for like clay and rock for sure, which is what I have here. It's what I had in my last place in California as well. So next place, who knows? probably may not be my favorite tool anymore. Maybe I'll go with the hoe that you've been uh, talking yeah, about for, it just, for a it just while. Shows you the, the difference between, I, I highlight the fact that basically that it's different. Every every single person is going to have a completely different growing situation. And it's about learning Absolutely. about the, the teaching a thought process rather than uh, do X, Y, and Z. So you have to, and as, a, as designers, that's, our job is to get get that sorted for someone very quickly. Yes, e absolutely. Even though the tools you use differ in different climates and your circumstances, and like I, I wouldn't. And abilities used, too. I, yeah, and uh, because uh, you, you you're gonna have to be physically fit to lift this thing. I can imagine it's yes. quite heavy. It's like a big massive crowbar. It's a great uh, workout if you if you're able to do it. Uh, just don't, don't, don't <laughs> you see someone using one? Don't go near them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, especially if they're being chased by like a zombie or something. But I suppose uh, you don't, don't want to do that anyway. So I think next, next we talked about the uh, you talked you talked about equipment and the, the basic equipment. Yes, to get started. went into the equipment. Yeah, and and that the equipment side of it is interesting because it's like, well, what is equipment? Um, it just, it's like what you were saying about the tools. It's really going to vary based on your climate and your abilities and your comforts. Like one of the examples is, you know, your small motors. So you've got a push lawnmower, which for me, where I am right now on a very, on a small urban property, I don't have a lot of grass. My neighbor uses the, um, the, oh, what do you call it, Cormac, with the blades and you just push it and it, and it just turns. It's, it's a manual mower. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, just the, it's the old like uh, rotor mower or something they call it. Is it just? Yep. Uh, and then the, then there's the gas mowers and then there's the electric mowers. So it just comes down to what your preference is or what your accessibility is to, you know, the fuel or what your mindset is. Are you against using gas powered mowers or not? My neighbor uses one of the, the manual rotary ones. I use a gas mower, which is frowned upon um, by a lot of different people. It's been something that works for me on my small space. And then I had one, we had half an acre um, in one of our previous properties that had a mower when you squeeze the handle, it's self-propelled. 
So that would be really useful for someone who might have difficulty with the pushing motions, you know, if, with with, the, with abilities. Having a self propelled one, basically, you just squeeze it and then you just walk yeah, behind I, it, and I, the most. Oh my god, that thing is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I just but then you've got the ride on ones, right? Where you can sit on them, and I, I, they use those a lot in uh, parks, public parks, and spaces where they have a lot of lawns and things to mow um and you can sit on them and you can use them that way now people might be sitting here listening to us like why are you talking about lawns well some people still have lawns not everyone is growing food on them and grass for me where i'm at is actually preventing a lot of erosion and runoff on my property in one of the areas where we are and it's a great place for my dog and for my kids so i still do have some lawn and i'm not 100 percent against that most of what i have growing is food though um, but you still need some of that equipment to manage those kinds of spaces as well, because to get long grass, especially in certain areas, if you let the grass get out of control and you're not maintaining it with whatever equipment you've got, you could end up attracting snakes and things like that. That's not an area I'm going to let my kids play in at that point. So knowing the equipment to use and how you need to maintain that space is pretty important. Some of the other equipment as well was like knee pads, headlamps, um, just like odd things that you might need to take out into the garden. I like wearing overalls with pockets, but I also have an apron and some people like tool belts, anything that you can keep those extra things that you might, you know, want to take with you, like your cell phone. Some people just love to have their cell phone in the garden. I, I Instagram, so <laughs> I don't mind having it with me sometimes. Uh, here there's a, tool belts are very much a, an American thing. Uh, here it's like yeah nobody nobody's nobody uses tool belts here uh in the garden but well, i haven't seen it anyway uh it's normally the well, what do you use pockets and the, yeah just pockets uh so me i i garden my wellies i try to get out in the summer when it's nice and dry i try to get my bare feet you know that sort of earthen thing as well and i'm there i just read pretty yes. about it like you just get get your feet in the dirt um, but yep. then you've a then you've a risk the other dropping the tools on your toes. It's just not nice. I know there's that that balance of uh that personal protective equipment, right? Having having that and then being in touch with the soil yeah. and nature so and the earth. It's like don't do anything daft. So if you're leaning over a, a bed, if you're a raised bed, and you're leaning over two feet. You're not going to drop it in your feet. You're not. You're just not. Yes, if you drop it, right. it's not going to land on your feet. But if you're doing something stupid. To, you're using the tool up here. Say you're uh, say an overhead flower pot. Don't use the tools over there in your bare feet because if you drop it, you're, you're going to hurt your toe. It, uh, it goes common, your toes. Common sense. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Equipment wise, again, I think it's the same as the tool wise. Just start slow and build up. Um, yes. Because we're like, where do you stop? There is no stop. I have a, I have a gas powered, you call it gas, petrol powered lawnmower. Petrol powered, yeah. I, I don't know why anybody would object to that because, um, it's the whole emissions thing, you know, and everything that goes into all of that. And that's I respect all of that. I think that we need to phase ourselves into other forms of energy. But right now, for small motors, that's that's a lot of what we have available to us. I would say get started and don't worry about all these bigger issues. And then as you get into it more, yes, you can start using a scythe when you're 10 years on it and you don't want to use your gas powered motor anymore. But trying to do all these things without the technology straight away, you're going to fail. Yes, so absolutely. Get the most important thing is being in the garden, work in the garden, and then you can just get into this time. think about all these higher philosophical stuff later on. But to me, it, would, it shouldn't be a barrier for people to get out. The tools are available. Agreed. They've been made. There's been carbon emissions to make the things. The petrol is minute. If you think about it, it's not. It's it's not going. To, you're not using your gas powered lawnmower. Isn't going to make it. It's not a. It's a drop in the ocean. So, I would for a beginner especially don't get hung up about it. But these issues will come up I naturally, agree. and then you just go well. That I'm ready now to get my scythe out and leave me more. Like I couldn't do without my strummer. 
how else could I cut the grass? Yes, I can put animals on it, but then I don't want to put animals in the front garden. I can tell you, when I was heavily pregnant with all four of my kids, the last thing I wanted to do was be pushing anything with a mower. And so the self-propelled mower was my best friend because my husband was away. And so it was just me taking care of stuff and being able to just squeeze a handle and walk behind it. I wasn't going into any labor. It was very comfortable. <laughs> so, and the lawn gets cut. And then I have a space for kids to play. That's safe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about definitely balance these things. Um, yeah. And I think you said it too. Like, don't get too hung up on stuff. Like, you really just have to start. If you don't, if you get hung up on the stuff, you put limitations on yourself. Um, did that make sense? Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're already handling your progress. These things will come to you, but they only come when you actually get in the dirt. And then you go, oh, I heard about that somewhere. And then you'll you'll, you'll go and yeah. pick it up again and you'll, you'll get on your phone when you're out there and you, it's it's about putting these wee nuggets of information in the back of your head and then you'll know. I think that's for me. I mean, that's, I want to be teaching people is they think about these things and then so you know, right, this is what I have to think about before getting in the garden, not A, B, C, here, go here, do this, do this, do this, do this. Yes. It's having yes, that thought I process agree. and giving people the freedom to just go out and start digging and make mistakes. I think, I think that you it. learn so much from those mistakes, right? Like that's yeah. really where you you then go back into that reserve and it's like, well, hang on a minute. I remember hearing something about that one tool one time and maybe that would be a better solution for this. So, and, and naturally through your experience and, and practice, it just comes to you. The, yeah. That's my experience of it at least too. And that's what you're going to have to do because it's a big undertaking. You just can't go out and you no. Know, read about this for it's a couple phased. of days and go that's it it's just it takes and then you get better <laughs> you find out your own where you're at yourself what you can do what you can't do what you like doing what you don't like doing you know something that i found was really useful in that as well and this is not everywhere so it's for those who are listening who might have the opportunity to do this but it was going out to community gardens that are operational and just sort of having a look what are people growing what are they using? Where are they getting their seeds? What does the community look like? What tools do they have on, on site? And where are they keeping them? How are they keeping them? Talking to anybody who's out there who's doing it, especially for a beginner, you might meet another be beginner gardener in a community garden and then you learn from each other. Or you might bump into someone who's really experienced and they can just give you some of those nuggets of wisdom that are very regionally specific. Um, and for me going out to community gardens and just even walking around and just looking at what was growing, what was thriving, what had bugs on it, what was diseased. Those things were really important observations to be making, especially if you're new to a particular area. So being a military family and we've moved around, going somewhere new, not always understanding what the climate conditions and things and plants and what's working and what isn't, something like that for a beginner you jump into it and you have a look at what's already, what's existing and then try and sort of, and go to more than one if you've got that available to you. We had to to drive an hour and a half to get to one um, where I am right now, but it was so worth it because I was able to have a look at what plants were really thriving in the conditions here. So that's pretty important. Yeah, even commercial places, I know there's a commercial place near me has like a volunteer Thursday or something and Go, to, go there and learn and pick up bits and pieces and then you get to know others and then it just starts that conversation and it just becomes part of your life where you just, yep. it just becomes second nature to you that you're out you're doing this stuff and it'll come to you all this yeah. <laughs> you're not you're not going to learn it you can get away with so little just going out and trying it but then once you try it you build them layers of knowledge on top then suited for your climate your conditions and all to your person yeah if you're, if you're struggling then you can give us a shout and we can help you yeah <laughs> yeah we have got yeah. experience in many many different regions of the world between our crew haven't we with all yeah. the moving that we've done as a family within my own household we've had a lot of experience across the united states and australia and then you and i've worked together designing we've designed in a couple different countries well, um, yeah, for me, I'm, I'm from I'm from zone four 
up to his own nine, nine B. Yeah. That design. So from Florida to Yep. Uh, Sweden. <laughs> Sweden was the coldest at all. Yeah. Oh. Crystal, thanks very much. Is there anything you'd like to add now before we go? No, that was great. It was good to hang out and chat all things garden. <laughs> <laughs> it always has. Uh, I don't know if it, it could go on for hours, but... Uh, it really could. We could uh, get stuck here all day. <laughs> just talk all day. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, thanks, everybody, for listening in. Uh, we'll be back again next Thursday. We launched time there in episode three. And we'll be back with podcasts as well next.